Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my joy and my privilege to welcome all of you at this afternoon debate. I'm Nico ravelo and I shall be the moderator at this event. My responsibility as a moderator this afternoon is to make sure that the debating process and the forum period during which time you, members of the audience, are invited to address questions to the debaters, I'm, I need to make sure that that process will move along at a good pace. I would like to start by thanking this church for its hospitality. I know that there are not many members of this church this afternoon uh, here because they're all the way at the camp. But I would like to ask the representatives of the church to please convey our thanks, our heartfelt thanks to Pastor Andy Barnard and his congregation. Debating is one of the glories of living in a democracy. And I hope that uh, this, uh, this event will be uh, characterized by one word, respect. Respect, first of all, for the chair, and then respect for one another. I hope that you, four gentlemen, will not resort to personal attacks, but will deal with facts and evidence. You, members of the audience, are not going to agree with everything that is going to be said here today, but I hope that you'll respect the differences of opinions. To make this debate an enjoyable and interesting experience for all of us, let's listen with respect to the speakers. There will be no shouting of amens or alleluias or alak bar during a speech. And please, express only your appreciation when a speaker is done. And you'll only clap, or rather applaud, at the end of every presentation. This afternoon, our four debaters on the platform will concentrate on convincing you, the audience, to agree with their stand on the topic of salvation in the Bible and the Quran. Which way? The narrow way or the straight way? Why should we be interested in what these four gentlemen have to say about salvation, heaven, eternal destiny, or afterlife? The answer is very simple. We should be interested in what they have to say about eternal issues because we are dying people. We are dying people. Martin Luther writes, life is a constant and daily journey towards death. One after another dies and the living must merely engage in the miserable business of carrying one another to the grave. All of us are traveling the same road together. Indeed, all of us, whether we are Christians or Muslims, are traveling together on this journey towards death. Woody Allen joked that he was not afraid of death. He just did not want to be there when it happened. Whether Woody Allen liked it, likes it or not, he will be present when death knocks on his door. We are all face to face with this grim business of death, which is, of course, the gateway to the awesome reality of eternity. And this is the reason why we should be interested in the truth about salvation and heaven. I would like now to introduce to you the four debaters who will try to present convincing arguments in support of their own points of view on these critical and vital issues. And let me start with the Muslim team. The principal debater on the Muslim side is Bashir Vanya. Bashir is the director of the Islamic Information Center and has many diplomas in Islamic, comparative religion, and secular studies. He has debated many national and international scholars on Islam and related issues. He has also written numerous articles and booklets on Islam and comparative religion. Some of his booklets and articles have been translated into other languages. He has also been on radio and television discussion programs. Bashir also teaches the Quran and comparative religion classes and is involved in doing basic counseling, journalistic and social work. And I must add that Bashir is married to lovely Nazima and they have got two children. We always forget the wives. The secondary speaker on the Muslim side is Muhammad Rafiq Omar. Muhammad is a member of the Islamic Info Center as well. 
He has been an Islamic activist for many years and has been involved in social work. He's also a keen student of the Quran and comparative religion and is involved in propagation work informally. And Mr. Kovadia was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately he has, he has had to be somewhere else. Mr. Kovadia wishes him well. Mohammed is married and has two children, two boys and two girls. Oh, four children. I, can't, I don't know how to count. Thank you. <laughs> two boys. Okay. Two boys and two girls. On the Christian side, uh, the principal debater is George Usni. Four children. Born and raised in Lebanon, George Usni's background in psychology, linguistics, and intercultural studies has contributed to the production of two books in Arabic, Bible translation projects in Arabic and Kurdish, an indigenous Arabic Bible study curriculum in cooperation of Sikuk Foundation, and the 13-year publication of Richard to the Muslim world. He travels to 99 countries, and his 40 years of experience in evangelism, discipleship, and church planting have culminated in the development of two training programs, Engaging Islam, for church members and missionaries, and Caps to Lions for Christians for, from Muslim backgrounds. As founder and president of Horizons International, George, along with, with his family and global staff members, strives to awaken, awaken the church to the task of boldly proclaiming to the, the gospel to the nations. The secondary speaker on the Christian side is Jay Smith. Jay Smith comes from solid missionary stock. He was born in India from missionary parents, and he spent his first 17 years in that country. He's married and has three sons. I got it right? For 30 years now, Jay has been engaging with Muslim people, seeking to explain the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ and challenge objections to him. He has taken part in about 60 formal debates with distinguished Islamic figures including events with Benazir Bhutto, Sheikh Omar Bakri Mohammed, and Sheikh Abu Hamza al Misri. It is, um, Jay is often to be found at Speaker's Corner in London, where he, where he has been living for the past 20 years. He has also been a frequent visitor to university campuses, taking part in classes, and helping Christians, uh, Christian unions rather, in their ministry to Muslims. Jay is recognized as a leading expert and practitioner in Christian apologetics and polemics to Muslims. Now, let me just tell you about the format of this debate. George Usni, who is the principal debater from the Christian team, will be the first to give his opening statement. Then Bashir Vanya from the Muslim team will follow with his constructive speech. They will each speak for 20 minutes. Both of them will be followed by the, the secondary speakers who are going to speech each, speak each for 10 minutes, and then uh, the rebuttals will follow. And the rebuttals will last 10 minutes each. And all of this will be followed by the forum period. And you, at that time, will be asked to, um, to address questions to the debaters. And the debate will end with the summations. Bashir Vanya, as a principal uh, Muslim speaker, would be the first to give his concluding remarks for five minutes. And then the person who speaks first gives the final summation, and that would be George Usni. Gentlemen, I'm looking forward to a debate which deals with facts and evidence, and which is free of the passion of a shouting match or personal agreement. I hope that it will be fun for you and inspiring and, uh, and beneficial for the audience. Thank you. Over to you, George. Thank you very much. <coughs> you tell them to applaud. <laughs> George, give that applause now. That will be for me. <laughs> that was for her. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to see happy faces here and some sleepy faces. Uh, I wonder just uh, how many Christians are here, or at least you claim to be. Whoa. How many Muslims, or you claim to be? So, if it's a democratic vote, we have won already. So, <laughs> let's just sit down and go home. 
Now you accept Jesus as your Savior. Is that good, fair, fair game? Well, why didn't you bring more Muslims? You tried. Well, next time we'll hope to have more Muslims here because I don't want to talk to the choir. But you, each one who's here, is worth 10 of you. That's why it's worth talking with you. All right? So here we go. I greet you in the name of the one true God, the living God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 6, the angels in the presence of God can't help themselves but say, Quddus, 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 Rabbul Junood, Majduhu Mil, Kul al Ard. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. So I want us to start with that. Now we get to our topic, salvation. What is this topic? What does it mean? Basically, in the Christian sense, salvation is a rescue operation. Someone is in, caught in fire and can't get out. What can they do? They can scream, they can holler. They need help. They need someone from outside to come and rescue them from the fire. Same with someone who's drowned and doesn't have any means of saving himself. You know the Titanic a hundred years ago, hundreds of people lost their lives, even though some of them may be good swimmers. Some of them were very smart. Some of them were intelligent and rich and uh, have high status. Uh, and yet when they got in the water, they couldn't do anything and they died. Some of them were rescued. Same with a prisoner. If you are in jail and you are smacked with millions of rand and you cannot possibly pay for it, you can't get out of jail or prison unless someone bails you out. And that's what salvation is to the Christian. Basically, that human beings are helpless and they need intervention from above. Does anybody need salvation? Well, in more biblical words, we say we are sinners. We are sinners. We believe that um, every human being is a sinner. There's a debate about original sin or not. Let's not get to that point right now. Some might choose to do that later. But we are sinners anyway. Whether it's original or not original, we are sinners. And salvation is to save us from our sin. But why are we sinners? The Bible tells us we are all slaves to sin. We are slaves to Satan. And therefore we are headed to hell. And we need rescue. We need to be rescued from our sin. I don't know, I don't want to ask you too many questions, but ask yourself, am I a sinner? If you are a sinner, you need a savior. I met a, a Muslim Arab man named Walid. And I had this conversation with him. I said to him, how do you enter heaven? How do you go to heaven? You see, salvation is about avoiding hell and going to heaven. Right? So I said, how do you enter heaven? And he told me about the good deeds, about the prayers, about the fasting, about the five pillars of Islam. And, and I said, do you do these? Do you do these? He said, of course, I do them as well as I could. I said, are you assured that you will be saved? He said, no one knows. We can't tell. I'm not sure. Well, I've asked many Muslims this question. Even at the footsteps, on the steps of the Azhar University, when I was living in Egypt, I talked with three scholars there. I said, what do you do to go to heaven? And they told me the same thing. Of course, different people say it different ways. Some people add repentance. Others say good deeds, more good deeds, and so on. And the weighing good deeds against the bad deeds. 
a scale, the angels here. I won't get to that now. And they said the same thing. We don't know. Only God knows. Allahu A'lam. We depend on God's mercy. So one of these Imams, not those three, another one that I talked to, and I've talked to many of them over the years, I asked him a question which has nothing to do with salvation. I said, do you have a car? He said, yes. How many of you have a car? Okay, so you can sympathize with my reason for asking him. I said, are you uh, insured? He said, yes. I said, do you pay your dues, the monthly dues? Do you do everything necessary to keep your insurance current? He said, yes. I said, so if you go on a drive and you get into an accident, are you sure the insurance company will take care of the cost of the accident? He said, absolutely. So did you read the fine lines? Isn't there some way there they can get out of it? He said, no, I know, and in fact, it has happened to me, and they covered it except for the deductible. I said, how come you are more sure of a human agency called insurance company than of your religion, of God? Can, is it possible that God would leave you wondering where you're going, and you're not sure? You try your best, you try your best. Well, you know, Walid, I asked him the same question. And I asked him another question. I said, you're now 55 years old. You've done a lot of bad things in your life. How many years are you going to live to make up the difference or to catch up with your bad, to outweigh the bad things you've done? And at that time he said, I really hope that God will give me long life so I can do a lot of good things to balance the bad things. And I asked him this question that I ask now of my wonderful debaters. What if there is a way all of your sins, all of your sins, of all the past, everything you've done wrong, every thought that was wrong, every feeling you've had, any time you got angry, any time you lied or deceived or stolen or done anything, even, even if you've murdered somebody, what if all of these sins can be wiped out in a moment? And do you know what Walid said to me? He said, that's not possible. We have to work it out. We have to do things. So I said, basically, you're saving yourself. And the nature of salvation is that you cannot save yourself. And unless you admit that you are helpless before God, God will not save you. <laughs> you have to humbly come before Him in repentance and total dependence on Him. But that's not the end of the story. If you are in prison, the money had to be paid to get you out. Guess what? We have good news. Jesus paid all for all of your sins from the time you were born till now. When you surrender your life to him, when you believe in him and you tell him, I need you to save me, then he will show up and he will save you. This is the way to go to heaven. What about hell? What do you know about hell? Actually, where is heaven and where is hell? Do you have an address for it? Can you get on an airplane and fly over to heaven? How about the space shuttle? Can you force yourself into heaven? Can you get out of hell if you end up there? That shows us that we are totally dependent on God to save us from hell and to get us into his presence. Heaven is a place where God lives forever and ever. And the only way you can go there is with his permission. You don't go because you have dreamed a certain idea. I know people who ask me, can you take me to America? Can you get me a visa to go to America? I say, you know, there are some things you, you should do to go to America. There's rules of the game. Uh, you can go as a student, you can go as a visitor, you can go as a businessman, as a refugee, all kinds of things. But not everybody qualifies.